Anessi Baub, I'd like to extend a warm welcome and thank you for joining us for our Collega Camry Teaching and Learning Network Teach Meet event. My name is Kelly Edwards and I'm Director of Development at Collega Camry. We're grateful to Welsh Government for funding these events as part of the Teaching and Learning Network. The Teach Meets are designed to provide an opportunity to share good practice and to, to support knowledge exchange between further education and work-based learning colleagues across the FE sector in Wales. So some housekeeping before the event gets underway. Please note that your microphone and videos have been switched off for this event. There's a chat box. We welcome questions or comments in English or Welsh and we'll endeavour to answer them during the event. Where this is not possible, we will follow up with the individual later on. <clears throat> this afternoon, we're delighted to introduce uh, Nina Jackson of Independent Thinking, who has a background in mental health and well-being and has had an overwhelming impact on children, teachers and parents alike. Nina will chair the event and will talk to us about pedagogy, practice and the four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity and care, looking at how lecturers and educators and continue to inspire students to be the best they can be. We'll then hear from members of the Club East Network of Colleges, Colleague Camoys, Colleague Gwent, Cardiff and Vale College, the David Sixthorn College, the College Merthyr Tidville and the Gent College. We're grateful to them all this evening for their input. And now I'll hand over to Nina. Oh, thank you, Kelly. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here with you this evening, or rather this afternoon, I guess. It is going to be an absolutely fantastic event. I feel really privileged and I'm just going to start now. I'm going to kick off because basically we have got no time to waste. We've got so many things to be sharing with you this evening. So I am Nina Jackson. And I'm from Independent Thinking. Croeso'i chigid heno. I'm going to be talking to you about four C's. I adore four C's. Pedagogy, practice, the four C's. Communication, the way that we can communicate with each other. Collaboration, creativity and care. And how we, as lecturers and educators, can continue basically to inspire all of the young people that we actually work with on a daily basis basis. So to start off, let me just share about all of this, why it's important for us to inspire students to be the best that they can be. We want to develop them into well-rounded individuals so they, that they are able to go out into the world and just be able to meet all the challenges that they're going to face, to be able to do fantastic things with all of the skills, pedagogy and practice that you have instilled on them. So to think about this, we have to start with communication, Kavathrebi. And with Kavathrebi, the whole communication, it's the way that we use so many things from language, the diverse learning experiences, opportunities and strategies that we give to them. Making sure that they've got opportunities to write things down, to speak it, record it, share it and store it which then allows us to really think about how we can embed and blend digital technology as well. We know through accessibility features that what we've got is that we can use text, um, speech to text, and we can use many of the other things which are embedded with regards to accessibility. But this experience of learning, thinking, retrieval and reflection is going to also give them 21st century skills to, to allow them to be able to adapt in a variety of different situations. Now, when we're giving these diverse learning opportunities and strategies, it's going to be really, really crucial that we use the right language, that we use the right sort of um, body um, experience with them as well. I'm trying to admit people at the same time as I'm talking and trying to multitask. So maybe that's one of my 21st century skills. Who actually knows? But then to be able to speak it, either through somebody else, if you've got um, a student who's got particular difficulties, maybe anxiety or stress, or maybe some specific language and speech difficulties. So you can use a digital device or you can have somebody who's going to be their actual voice. And there's nothing like 
recording progress. So for example, we are recording this session tonight. Why? So that we can share it and we can collaborate with our other colleagues so that they are able to learn not only from us, but from each other, how audio and video recording right now is fantastic. And we mustn't forget, of course, the power of analog writing as well, and how fantastic that can be to keep stories, to share things in life, and it becomes historical. Sharing them in different ways, through conversations, through one-to-one, -one, and then being able to share it and show it in the digital world that we're currently living in, but also in these group discussions that hopefully we're going to allow them to participate in. So with the collaboration, the key Kidwaithyo, how we're going to move forward, it's really thinking about how we can give interpersonal relationships, high level of inclusion and trust in group collaboration. And when there's controversy or conflict, that what we actually do is maybe instill the whole idea of, yeah, but you know, on one hand, it could be like this. And have you thought that maybe on another hand, it could be presented or shown in a different way? And when we collaborate together as practitioners, as we know, we're using many, many different versions. Now, this evening, we're using obviously the digital sphere to do that. However, isn't it fantastic when we're face to face with people? Not only can we read their body language, but we can read whether or not they fully understand what it is or what point it is that we're putting across. When working with students and being collaborative with them and taking them on their learning journey is to give them roles and responsibilities as well so that they can make some key decision making factors in what it is either they need support with or that they can celebrate their work with you or maybe buddy up with other learners of similar ilk as well. Group work activities are fantastic, whether or not it's actually online in breakout rooms or if you're using Teams in your discussion rooms, but also then to think about how we can get our students as we do for ourselves, okay, is to set goals, whether they be um, immediate goals, interim goals or long-term goals and get students to really think about how they can set themselves goals. And that's through the whole aspect of purpose. Now, why is purpose important? Purpose is really important because it's purpose for self. So on a daily basis, I don't know about you, but I need to know what my purpose is in and for the world and for myself. So three strands, purpose for self, purpose for others, and purpose in the bigger world and then once I know I've got purpose or a reason for being or for doing then once I get accepted or you as lecturers and educators get accepted within that community of learning you have that sense of belonging you give a student a sense of belonging and you're giving them one of the greatest gifts in the world which is to feel that they matter that their voice matters their thinking matters and the skills and the strategies that they're using to guide themselves in learning really really matters as well and what's fantastic thank you to the translator as well who's put all of those key things that i just wanted to share with you through the medium of welsh and of course welsh is my first language um, although if I don't have somebody that I can practice my language with regularly, which if we're talking about collaboration, if I don't have those skills, I, I can maybe lose a little bit of confidence or self-esteem because maybe I'm not fully functioning with regards to the trigliada, as we call them. So collaboration and communication for us as practitioners is really good. And if we look at Dusky Kidwai Threadall, which is collaborative learning, it isn't about one size fits all. Now, let me tell you something, okay? I've worked for years to look as glamorous as this. Obviously, you can just see now sort of necker, but I've just got a beautiful body, curves in all the right places, lumps and bumps in all the right places. But you know, when it says to you, oh yeah, that one size fits all, trust me, I've tried a few and they're just a little bit tight in a few areas. So one size definitely does not fit all. 
which is why we have to give what I call these variety of experiences, this learning buffet, whether it be digital, analog, collaborative, or whatever the case may be. And if we move on to looking and really thinking about creativity, whoa, you know, I would argue that everybody is creative. And if we talk about creativity, often so many people think that creativity is linked with the arts in particular. Well, let me tell you something right now. I'm going to give you two pieces of bread, a bit of cheese and a tin of beans. What I'd like you to do in the chat for me now, I'd like you to be creative and tell me what are you going to come up with, with two pieces of bread, a slice of cheese and some beans. Let's be creative in our thinking. This is the chance for you to tell us what you can do and maybe give me a little bit of a chance to think of what I'm going to eat tonight. Paul, thank you very much for your direct message to say you're going to, you're going to let me to do a pizza. Ooh, 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 bring it on. And Lynn, you're going to make a beans and cheese toasty. Oh, oh, I like your style. I really, really do. And the thing is, there are so many different things that you could do with this, isn't there? Possibly you could maybe... Would you then take the bread, maybe toast it slightly and then grind it a bit. And so then you've got um, some crusty topping to put on maybe a bean and cheese pie. I love the fact that Phil has said, roll out the bread and make a Mexican cheesy bean wrap. Oh, Phil, let's have a hot date. Eleanor says a savoury smoothie. Oh, I've not tried that one. Maybe we could, could. Cheesy croutons with liquidized beans. Ooh, beans and cheese hot pot and a toasty crouton. Oh, and Phil says, but you know, everybody, I'm an artist. Let me be creative. So do you know what? I definitely think, yes, Phil, let's take on board. I think so far yours is a winner this evening. So you see, when you take something and you take different minds and brains to think about how you could be creative with something, I mean, those are items that I gave you. But imagine being creative with um, possibly your thinking. Um, and Lee is gone, beans and toasty lasagna. Oh, do you know what? Honestly, we could be having a whole recipe ebook tonight just from this session. And I'm loving your creative recipes. So when we are looking at being creative, I want you to think about how we can embrace creativity with your student through the ADAPT model. So, cyfleid your creative great gadach mwfarwyr, rwydd hai, darganfod, penodi, rhagnodi, ac addysgu. So to absolve, which is basically together, we all get our thoughts, we discuss maybe challenges that we're facing, we discuss alternatives, and we discuss different ways forward. Then we take on the D, which is the discovery together through collaborative creative learning. And with this, we can make an inventory of tools, thoughts, ideas, maybe use mind maps, maybe have a visual board, maybe even just capture that through audio, like I mentioned to you earlier. Then we could actually appoint. And when we appoint, we narrow all of this together, narrow all of it down so that actually if we think about where this fits in with our learning or within their learning. And then we prescribe. So together, embracing this creativity, we apply all of the tools and the techniques that we have as individuals, as groups, but collective to actually apply the learning. And then of course, what we do is we go into the teach aspect, which is we put all of this into practice. Now, these will be a variety of different ideas through listening to others. Maybe a student can think, oh, I never even thought about that one. I could maybe use that and try it out so that they can build resilience and adaptability in the way that they're moving forward with their pedagogy, practice and learning themselves, because they could become pedagogical practitioners by teaching, sharing and supporting so many others as well. And let's have a look at the 12 benefits of creativity. Now, if you happen to follow me on Twitter, on Twitter, 
I'm at Music Mind. I got this obsession with sketch doodles but I was inspired originally by the fantastic sketch noter that is Sylvia Duckworth. Now, for me, this visual is fantastic. I don't have to start from the top, work across to the right and read as if I would do a clock or a book. I can zoom into something. So I'm gonna zoom into number nine because I see this eye looking at me saying that creativity improves our ability to focus. I think it improves our ability to focus if we haven't got maybe what I call a spaghetti head. When you've got so many strands of thinking going on that you don't know how to unravel them. So this is where obviously we take that route of collaboration and communication with others to say, I've got all this thinking going on and I'm not really sure how to unravel it. Well, first of all, let's be creative in allowing this individual, the student, to unravel their thinking. Have you thought about using a mind map? Have you thought about literally just writing down or saying all of the key things that are going on in your head? Maybe key words, maybe key um, ways of, of going at your learning. And then of course, what it allows, number two there, is it allows somebody to express themselves in a unique way, which is individual to them. If we look at number 12, which I think is fantastic, creativity encourages us to be lifelong learners. When I say us, anybody who is a learner, we, as educational practitioners, if we're creative in the way that we're thinking, approaching things, being blended. Yeah. Can you put yourself on mute, please? Thank you. Um, that what we can do then is that we can develop our skills to be lifelong learners so that we can navigate things in our lives. And we know, sadly, that we've lost one of the most creative gurus in our lifetime, I guess, which was Sir Ken Robinson, saying that creativity now is as important in education as literacy, and we should treat it with the same status. So if I get you to think about this, we've got some sort of en potential energy crisis going on. We've got some sort of potential issues with, I hear, pigs in blankets. Um, we've got some potential issues with other global things in our world as well. So is it not through creative thinking, creative application and ways of problem solving, either individually or together, that we can move these things forward? But also as well, we need to know the importance of creativity for emotional well-being. It can really, really help with stress and anxiety, particularly if your students and you think of the benefits of ways that allows them to actually find balance. It may be escaping from everything and watching something great on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Sky or on their videos or on their um, digital devices on YouTube. It may be some mindfulness. It may be discussion, sharing, walking, talking. It may be even texting, collaborating with somebody else, or it may be a form of just somebody going outside, doing some running, doing some talking, anything that can actually take you into this world. And if we look at this through the medium of Welsh, I mean, in itself, the use of the Welsh language to actually describe creativity through crea degrees, and that in itself is beautiful. So when I talk about language, think about the beauty of language. For example, did you know that um, if it was snowing right now, I would be describing the snow as there are flim flams all on the ground because a flim flam is a word for a snowflake. And I'm sure today and probably right now, there are many of you who are aqua bibs. An aqua bib is somebody who drinks water. And I'm not sure, are any of you going to be titty nopes tonight? No, I didn't hear any laughing. But if you are a titty nope or a titty nope, it means that you're going to be using leftovers to eat. It's brilliant, isn't it? OK, so you can use language in many, many different ways as well. And if we go in then to looking at Goval or care and why this is absolutely, absolutely crucial. 
when you allow a student to feel that they belong, belong to the community of learning, belong to the class, belong to the college where they're studying and belong to everything that they want to be a part of, then what you're doing is you're enhancing their well-being. Perthin, e perthin, to belong. It is a basic human need for us to flourish and to be well. Once we belong, we can connect, we can relate, we can assist, we can share. And it's saying to us, you value me as a human being for who and what I am. And that's absolutely crucial. You know, as soon as you say to a student, you, yes, that's you, the individual that you are, you belong here in this community of learning. You belong in this learning space. You belong in the wider community because you have skills, attributes and individual qualities that are magical to just you that are going to have an impact on the future. As soon as you instill in them the self-esteem and confidence through careful language and purpose full intervention, then you're giving them hope and you're giving them optimism. But you know, more than anything is to allow them to be who they are. I mean, I often say, particularly when I'm waking first, waking up first thing in the morning, good morning, Lara, aren't you looking so gorgeous tonight, uh, today? Now, I've always aspired to look like the character Lara Croft, okay? Only because I fantasise about wearing one of those all-in-one things that she had in Tomb Raider with strap-on guns. Because I just think, yeah, I mean, I could be doing anything then. But I look in the mirror and I go, no, you're not Lara Croft, you're Nina Jackson. And you've got other magical ingredients. I just think it's because I want to be slim and trim. But you know... I am who I am and I'm proud of who I am and I hope that you are for the amazing individual that you are. As soon as we do that, we translate that to and with students, what we're doing is we're saying you matter every single day for who and what you are, even on those dodgy days where maybe they've said to you, back off, you can do it, I ain't doing this. Okay, every day is a new day. Let's wipe that slate clean as uh, Michelle Pfeiffer did in Dangerous Minds because she said to the young people, do you know what? Yeah, you're going to have challenges. Yes, you're going to lose your rag. You're going to be angry. You're going to be so many things. However, I'm gifting you every day with an A star for everything, for your attitude, for the way that you're conducting yourself and you're learning, for the way that you're aspiring to be the best that you can be. And it's your job to keep that. Now, if we take on that mindset every single day and we share that with the students, say, I'm gifting you with total brilliance, creativity, hope, optimism, and actually strength and bravery to meet challenges. And it's up to you to carry those with you throughout the day. But fear not. If things don't go to plan, that's okay. Because tomorrow is another day where you will be able to gift yourselves all of those at the same time. So please, please, let's make sure that we, as part of the four C's, really put that care, the goval, into the right space and place. Mein bwysig i ni fel a thrawon i, I enogi pob un i daimlon gyffordus yn ffordd maen nhw'n dysgu. Cofio pob amser fod nhw yn bwysig hefyd. Rhoi'n bwysig, rhych chi'n bwysig a maen nhw'n bwysig hefyd. Pob un. But before I finish my session with you right now, Kin Bovin Dodi Ben Gadahun, Dwisha Dwight, Dioch and Vaur, Dioch Galon, thank you so much.
deep from my heart. Am bopeth rydi chi a phopeth rydi chi'n gwneud i'r pobl a'r pobl ifanc a'r plant a'ch gilydd. For all that you are and all that you do, for the children and the young people and the students, because you will have a variety of people that you work with and the way that you support each other. You may never ever know the impact that you will have on individuals. They may leave, well, they will leave college and they'll go out into the wider world, that big scary world or that big amazing fantastic world. And because of what you will have done with them, they will be able to communicate, collaborate, be creative, and also show care and kindness to other people as well. And what's really crucial at this time is that we understand through the variety of mediums that we use as pedagogical practitioners, the way that we pocket our passion for individual subjects and the way that we approach our own learning, if we can share that and model that to our students and just be our real human selves so that, for example, when we're having a bit of a tough day, it is actually OK to say, do you know what? I've got to tell you, today's a bit tough, right? OK, however, I still feel inspired to move on because I know that I hopefully am going to be able to help you to be the brilliant young people that you're going to be, because after all, if I end up in a care home, possibly one of you is going to be looking after me. And really, I'd like more than two jam sandwiches on a Sunday afternoon. Maybe I would like some of the fantastic things that people have created with their two pieces of bread, cheese and beans in this session today. And on a lighter note, OK, wherever you go from today onwards, take forward the four C's for you for others and have an impact for each and every one of your students. Be brave to try new things or be even braver to adapt the things that have always worked for you very, very well and maybe accessorize them or change them just that little bit. And at this point, I'm even quite impressed with myself that I've brought it to an end three minutes earlier than my scheduled slot. Because for those of you who know me, I got verbal diarrhea and I'm all right with that, to be perfectly honest with you. But the most important thing this evening is not my introductory part, but everybody's part that is now going to be from now till the end of the session that are going to share with you fantastic ideas, pedagogical practice and key things for you to take away and try, adapt and be creative with. So from this point right now, I'm going to finish my session and I'm going to invite the wonderful Paul Williams from Coleg Gwent or Coleg Gwent. It's Coleg if you're in Newport. If you're in the Swansea Valleys like I am, it's Coleg. OK, so whichever way we pronounce it, it doesn't really matter because the most important thing is it's Paul Williams. And Paul's going to do a, his session on podcasting for teaching and learning. So, Paul, welcome to the front. We're so excited to have you. <laughs> Dear Nina, um, can you hear me okay? Oh, yes, we yep. can. Tip top. Lovely. Thank you. Let me share my presentation. Um, Prenanda, everybody. Um, I'm from Essex, so we don't speak English properly there. So my Welsh is a little bit limited, although I am learning. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to talk about what I did earlier this year, which was some research into learning uh, and revision with podcasts. Um, I started off with my cohort of then AS learners. Um, there were about um, 69 of them. Oops, that's, that's it. There we go. And I wanted to ask, would they use podcasts for learning and revision? Um, I wanted to know would they benefit from me creating podcasts, uh, especially for their exams that and, and uh, determine grades that were coming up. And um, I wanted to find out how I was going to get them to engage more with different uh, modes of learning, like using audio and video. 
So I asked them if they thought podcasts might be useful to them. And um, the answer came back that yes, they would, but that they would prefer different types of podcasts for different purposes. So what I found out across the 69 learners who were in three different groups, that an average of 66% of learners said that they did already listen to podcasts, which was news to me because I wasn't sure how many would. 36% um, of the learners said that they already listened to educational podcasts, which was great news for me. Um, and then there was a small percentage who had even made their own recordings uh, previously uh, at GCSE to help them with their revision and learning. 100% um, of the learners had access to their own recording gear. Uh, which was exciting because one of the follow-on things I wanted to do with them was to get them making their own uh, podcasts for their own revision and learning. So that was a good basis to uh, to start with. And so then once I'd established would they use them, and there was a reasonable two-thirds that would, I then wanted to find out which types of podcasts would be useful for them, okay? So I made a selection of podcasts that I then allowed them access to, to see what they would consume. Um, and um, to see which ones they preferred. And the data came back from their usage. And uh, essentially, one of the most useful things that they um, consumed were the, the very short, uh, about two minutes in length, what we called listicle podcasts, which were like those kind of articles that have sort of like the 10 best things to do with something like five advantages of using focus groups or Murdoch's four functions of the family and things like that. And they, they like those. Um, they, uh, about 94% across the cohort said that uh, using these was um, beneficial for their learning and revision, and they found them very useful. Um, really, though, they were just like spoken lists, and uh, learners reported that they used them most effectively when they didn't have a lot of time, and they wanted to just remind themselves about a summary of important information. So that type was very well used. Then, um, then the other type that they liked was a, a more conversational question and answer, a sort of Socratic uh, podcast style for learning and revision. These could be about three to five minutes long, and they tended to involve two voices, which for me was uh, essentially um, either me uh, co-opting someone else to be a, um, a, a sort of a talking partner in the podcast or me putting on different voices and then editing it all together. Um, but they liked those and these were for longer um, conversations, uh, things like has the nuclear family gone out of fashion or are there more company directors called David than female company directors in the UK? Um, so these were a little bit longer. 73% of learners used them and said that they found them useful for their learning and revision. And then the, the final type um, that I made for them and that they used were more, they were longer narrative story-based podcasts. These were predominantly for revising and learning case studies. Uh, they were about five to 10 minutes long. Uh, they, they were single presenter, but I edited in some archive recordings uh, to make it a little bit more interesting. And so there was things like Oksana Malaya, who was raised by dogs, um, Milgram's Obedience Study and Lord Humphrey's Tea Room Trade, which are some of the, the titles. And 68% of the learners said that they used them and found them useful. So there was a gradually sort of descending scale of usefulness of these types. So essentially the longer the podcast, um, there was a slight drop off in usage and usefulness for the learners. Um, but this was you know, reasonably useful for me as a, as a guide because what I then wanted to do with them was I wanted to see would they make their own podcasts? And this was uh, really what I wanted them to be doing. Um, I, I'm quite happy to make podcasts for them. And I really wanted to see, would they explore making their own uh, and then using them? And would that be useful for their learning and revision? And the answer really was yes. Um, they would make them and they tended to want to either make short list sort of listicle uh, podcasts or they um, wanted to record longer discussions where there were a group of them. Um, one of the problems that I encountered with this stage was that most of them hated listening to the sound of their own voices and they preferred listening to podcasts that had been made by other people. So this became effective if they um, collaborated and they made podcasts and then they swapped and they listened to each other's. Um, just under 5% of the learners had previously made and listened to their own podcast for learning or revision. Um, but 85% of them said that they disliked it when I got them to record their own voices and listen to themselves. However, 60% of them said that they found it useful to record and use very short sort of listicle podcasts that were their own voice. So um, 
at that stage, I would got um, most of them engaged in using podcasts and I got most of them making podcasts to see what it was like. So um, at that point, it was a question of what equipment uh, did we need now for, for me i use uh, um, my, um, uh, an android it's a huawei p20 Lite and an iphone se 2020 uh, using the native voice recording app on either phone i had a, a smart lav um, lapel microphone which cost me 40 pounds and i used uh, a lightning adapter for the iphone and i had a an extension cable as well so for me it was a, a total expenditure of about 70 pounds but for the learners they already had everything they needed and they didn't really need to borrow anything from me so they um, were able to go with uh, the stuff they had so it was essentially free for them um so i got to the stage where i'd established that they were all able to use them and they with about two-thirds majority they enjoyed using them and wanted to carry on so the the stage that i'm at now so this is over the last few months so right now where i'm at is um, i want to see what we can do next with using podcasts in our learning and revision Global research that I've done uh, on podcast consumption around the world shows that the typical podcast consumer consumes about 44 minutes per day of uh, podcast content, normally while they're doing something else like going for a walk or going to the gym or relaxing or something like that. Um, so knowing this, I want to try and encourage my learners to sort of move towards doing the same so i'm going to where i'm going next with this is i'm going to habituate the learners early so in the as course i'm introducing using podcasts and this and making them quite early on in the course to see if by the end of the as year they're not approaching this sort of magical 44 minute figure a day and then hopefully um, we'll see um, some returns on uh, how they're using them so um yeah essentially that's that's the sort of active research and that's the, uh, that's a, where i'm at right now um so um i don't know whether you can see my email there but if you want if you're interested in this i've got lots more information that i can share with you um so if you wanted to email paul.williams2 at collegwent.ac.uk i'm more than happy to, to to talk with you and share um information but if you've got any questions right now i'm also very happy to take questions so um this is the first question and answer of the day, isn't it? Now, shall I stop sharing, Nina? Yeah, that that would that would be great because we can possibly then see some people. Um, if you, if you want to um, ask Paul a question, you can use the reactions button. And um, I mean, I'm sure probably you know all 66 participants of us have actually got some questions for you. So I can imagine now if we all take our microphones off, it's going to be like some sort of cacophony <laughs> of sound. But if you've got a specific question for Paul, do you want to just go into reactions and raise your hand? OK, brilliant. Kev has got a question. Come on in, Kev. Hi there, How guys. How are you? Hi there. Good, thanks. Down in uh, near Slassie. Hi, dear. Oh, love. Not far <laughs> from me, then, is it? Not far from me. No, thanks very much, both of you. Uh, yeah, just hope you a quick question for Paul. How would you go about planning it? So... I'm interested in the, the setting the tech up, but I'll see then how do you think it through before you commit to doing it, you know? So um, really for me, it was a question of, is it gonna be useful to the learners and how? So, um, and, and so partly the research was trying to find out how it was. So once we established that they would listen to certain things, then it was a case of maybe taking 10 or 15 minutes in each lesson to say, let's get something condensed um, into a format that we can then record and then it was a case of sending them somewhere where they could record without being disturbed so we've got a few rooms here where they could do that so i'd build in a bit of time each lesson so it could be i mean it could be a starter but it worked really well as a plenary and so planning it in is like instead of um maybe having an exit ticket or something like that from a lesson i'd say right okay you can't go until you know you've done a recording which summarizes uh, three key things that you've learned today or something like that and just getting them into the habit of doing it um, and then once my idea was that once they got more habituated into doing it then they would start listening to their own voice and then maybe that wouldn't be such a terrible thing so yeah build, building it in every lesson just doing a tiny bit each lesson that that's fabulous paul and my brain now my creative brain was going there based on what kev was saying what, what kev's question was and uh, your fantastic response to that is this whole thing about collaborative podcasting so you've got ev you've got real evidence there of new instead of writing it down for so many students it can be a real challenge but to actually use 
the, the the voice to be able to you know you can hear it when somebody's excited about learning or or that oh do you know what it's, when I came into this right I just couldn't get my head around it at all but by the end of it I felt like a giant because Mr Williams had said to me do this have a look at this try this Oh, I tell you what, I feel fantastic. So we're not only are we capturing the progress of academic learning, but we're hearing in their voices as well how impactful it has been. I'll tell you what, I've had a boom shakala moment there listening to you, Paul, about fantastic use of podcasts. I adore podcasts. I've also always got the sounds up running in the back in the background with some of the outlook things that are going on so congratulations and brilliant 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 things so thank you so much Paul for sharing that with us in our teach with this evening and now okay. ladies and gentlemen we're going over to the lovely oh the one and only Jane Edwards from Colliga Camoid who's going to be doing invisible learning engaging learners and developing core skills in everyday sessions not some sessions but everyday sessions so jane um welcome we're very very excited to have you hello there how are you oh we're all tip top far better for having you with us right thank you thank you very much for that lovely introduction nina um hello and welcome everybody i'm here today to talk to you about my title, which is Invisible Learning. Sight of what is coming next. OK, so um, I'm going to start with engagement, or should I say the lack of engagement? We all know that engaging our FE learners with literacy and numeracy and integral skills has been an ongoing issue for decades. It's been perceived by many as an unsolvable problem. The main issue being many, if not most of our learners who enroll on vocational courses, do not necessarily understand the direct link between the chosen career path and skills. Many feel that these topics, literacy and numeracy for one, were left behind in school and as a result, they resent the timetable sessions of these subjects in college. And I'm sure everybody that's here tonight have got some experience of how this feels when you've got this lack of engagement with our learners. So to engage learners with skills, to me and to the people I work with, contextualization is key. This starts with ditching the formality of lessons. And this does require a little bit more effort in respect of engaging and teaching the learners about the relevance and importance of skills in every session and activity, not just in the core sessions. So following this, we also need to show learners what good skills look like in their area of study. So for example, within the UPS, so that's the Uniform Protective Services, we bring in police officers to talk to the learners about their job role and specifically about the skills that they use in the day to day work. It seems crazy, I know, but somehow when this message comes from a person in a uniform, the impact is extremely powerful. And following this, we can then get our learners to discuss with our visitor the development of these skills and how these skills will make them a better practitioner in the field or career that they want to venture into. That's the hook right there. And from this, we can create opportunities within scenarios in a practical but realistic way. For example, using communication skills within lessons um, to present a briefing session on the planning and management of an incident a task which encompasses so many skills that it is unreal. And our learners don't realize it until they've actually taken part in it. From the invisibility part of things, skills can have, add so much stretch and challenge to the most basic of sessions. This comes from sneaking in the use and development of skills into tasks and activities. 
Be creative with visuals, pictures, videos, or audio recordings where possible to add variety to our lessons and to enhance the teaching and learning experience. Move things forward by requesting the production of new information in various formats, um, giving our learners assessment choices, which I feel sometimes are limited. So when we give them assessment choices, now they have choices to make. This means our learners are now skimming, scanning, selecting, and recycling the information that we have provided. And we are challenging and encouraging the learners to find different ways to present what they have found and extracted in new and different ways. For example, uh, from a sport point of view, uh, rugby game analysis is a, is a nice easy one. It's about possession and territory, missed tackles and turnover stats, which are all numeracy related. Sport learners will embrace this analysis in this way. You know, they have been shown a, a video and they're asked to take notes or complete a tally chart. And they are really comfortable in presenting their findings in a relevant format. But as soon as you label this activity as a skills of core session, you've lost them. Excuse me, I've just changed my slide. Okay, so digitally, our learners are challenging themselves every single day. In fact, hourly. They are solving problems, they're teaching themselves how to learn via games and social media, and social media platforms effortlessly. They use an integral skill such as problem solving to improve their own performance in something that they enjoy. We can spark this interest in our classrooms with a little bit of creativity. Digital skills are now embedded into everything, most certainly into the examples that I've already shown you above. But please don't get fooled into thinking that this is just a tick box because it isn't. Digital skills need to have a purpose for them to be worthwhile. Enjoyment of tasks is also essential. And this starts with planning the learning experience. And I, I, you know, I like this word. And again, sneaking in as many relevant opportunities as you possibly can while highlighting and proving why good core skills are beneficial and also proving that they will have a positive impact on their own careers and their employment opportunities going forward. Thus, I suppose, making the impact of skills personal and creating a buzz culture which embraces skills, making skills relevant in every session. Good planning, it is essential. However, rigid structure, not so much. You've got to allow yourself and your students to be creative and encourage lateral thinking and the opportunity to present evidence in a variety of ways. We have to forget the classroom straitjacket. Allow our learners to do things their way, giving them learning and assessment choices. This starts with basic human connections, encouraging conversations that change views and attitudes, making analogies and stories to give an uplift on the impact of tasks, making every lesson a multi-skilled experience, drawing as much technical language into it as you can. This gives our learners an opportunity to stretch themselves, and then we are all learning together, which can't be a bad thing. When checking the achievements of outcomes, make a routine for learners to identify how and what they have learned. Encourage the learners to lead this process, support them to make the link on how skills have helped them to complete a task or achieve a higher, higher grade. How did you do that? Why did you use this skill? So none of what I've spoken about today is uh, this evening is new or groundbreaking. Most of what I have highlighted is stuff that we've all used in the past and maybe forgotten about. Often reinventing the tried and tested methods is all we need to ensure that we teach skills in everyday lessons invisibly. However, 
To make it work, accountability needs to be established early doors for everyone. Learners, tutors, course tutors, managers and support, we all need to know who's responsible for each part of the process. And our expectations of each other need to be clear and manageable. So put simply, to solve the unsolvable problem, we need to be on the same page. Collaboration is important and to me, the key to unlocking success. Um, I'm not sure about timings, but thank you very much. And have anybody got any questions, please? Oh, Jane, that was absolutely fabulous. I mean, just like brilliant. I, I love I love what you said then. We're going to come to that in the reflections and learnings later. Julie, you've raised your hand. Come on in, my lovely. Hello, how's everybody? Everybody okay? Um, oh, just one question, Jane. Um, you know I'm a big advocate for embedding skills, you know, integral and the core skills literacy numeracy. Um, how would you manage resistance with staff? Because ultimately I, you are going to get that. Definitely, Julie. Um, this is what we see a lot of um, in, in our everyday work at the college. But I think um, getting staff on board is the key to this working. And that has to be a collaboration effort between the staff who are working with our students and the technical staff, where we get together, we have conversations, we discuss how and where we can work together to make this work, sort of learning from each other. The core skill tutors have got those, um, those important skill set in knowing all things skills, but we are, the, we are the staff members who have got the um, we have got the knowledge of the of, of the day to day teaching. So by coming together and talking about things that we are teaching, assignments that our learners will be up against, surely that is the way to start things. This is what they need to know, and this is how I'm going to teach them. Can we collaborate on any of these things to make the teaching and learning of skills? more interesting for our learners. And it is all about making it interesting and relevant and showing them where that relevance occurs and how it will affect them when they go on to the next stage in their life, which will either be higher education or, um, or a job or a career. Excellent. Thanks, Jane. This is why bringing, bringing in speakers is really important, Julie. You know, bringing in that police officers and things like that to talk to people about how they use the skills that demonstrates how they use the how they use the skills in the day to day life, and we have to have those same conversations with skill staff as well. Excellent, thanks. Thank you so much, Julie, for your question, and Jane for so eloquently and passionately um, answering that. We're going to move on in a second. There's a question for you in the chat, Jane, once you've added hey, you. gin and tonic and your flake now and a bit of a lie down, <laughs> right, okay. Um, before we move on to our next speakers, can I say a massive thank you to those of you who have been celebrating on social media our fantastic event tonight so please please don't be shy get on there celebrate share this is all about collaboration communication creativity and care and you as fantastic um, pedagogical practitioners so share with the world how great this evening is and without further ado at this point okay, we're going to move on to i love this title teaching and learning in second life with Josephine Zay and Itzel from Cardiff and Vale College. So welcome to you, very excited. Thank you, Nina. Hello, thank you, Nina. Gaio is here as well from CABC, our virtual That's world it. learning expert. Hi everyone. Uh, let's see if you guys can see my screen now. Perfect. Great. So let's start then. Um, let me just bring us into the classroom so then we can start our session. So, and we're gonna start now. 
So teaching and learning in Second Life is an excellent example of how 21st century digital skills are promoted in the classroom. Let me showcase how Second Life is used to teach forensic science in a real life simulation environment for both curriculum and to train CAVC learners for world skills competitions. Second Life promotes social construct constructivism. It involves learners interacting with their peers through an avatar. Learners' avatars are customized so they can play different roles within the context of the subject using real life scenarios. Providing learners with experiential learner relevant to their career choices increases engagement, inspires and motivates them. We will share some CAVC student testimonials at the end of this video. What you are seeing on your screen are CAVC learners who, are, who were assigned roles that are most appealing in a crime scene role scenario. The roles were rotated to ensure inclusion, give everyone the opportunity to develop insights related to each role and give learners a choice. There is a higher rate of success in meeting learning objectives set for that lesson. According to Noz et al, this also allows learners to make meaning of their own learning experiences. Using PowerPoint slides in world facilitates giving instructions and delivery of theory. The pedagogical application used for this activity was project-based experiential learning. Where students are at the center of the learning process and the lecturer acts as a facilitator. This learners, uh, learners helps learners to develop higher order skills in line with Bloom's taxonomy. Learners achieve higher focus and deeper subject knowledge through Corb's learning cycle, fostering critical thinking too. This approach is applicable across a wide range of practical and vocational subjects in particular, and it is highly relevant when it comes to coaching learners participating in skills competitions. Independent thinking, problem solving, and being able to work under pressure are all skills that judges look for and are expected from a world skills center of excellence like CAVC. Educator can use a wide variety of interactive and engaging teaching tools emb embedded into this 3D environment. Note cards are used as activity handouts to give instructions, role play scenarios, links to resources and provide feedback. Navigating virtual worlds such as Second Life allows learners to develop digital literacy and communication skills through active learning, where, particularly when followed by group discussions. Students can communicate safely through voice or using the chat function. Gayo, our virtual world learning specialist, will tell you more about safeguarding later on. From the moment students enter the crime scene, they are required to follow this crime scene protocol and apply theory previously covered in class. Learners take ownership of their, own, uh, of their assigned roles and tasks. Educators can conduct continuous assessment and provide feedback in real time. This worked extremely well during lockdown when CAVC forensic science learners entered the competition in March 2020 for the first time. CAVC won gold and our learner has got through to the World Skills Final, which is taking place this November. Scene reconstructions are carried out so learners can draw a hypothesis, searching for hidden objects like they would do in a real crime scene, link to the scenario, place markers and take photos. Evidence of work can be emailed to educators too. And ballistic is another type of field which is not easy for me to teach in class because it requires gun licenses and, and so on. So Second Life eliminates this barrier as students can use off simulation to learn what evidence can be found on a gun and what should they do if they find one. Second Life allows learners who have learning difficulties to gain confidence and be able to provide more detailed answer. Retention is higher compared to the classroom teaching a student can process information and remain focused on tasks during active learning. The AVC TAL team has not only provided expertise to enhance teaching, learning and, and assessment, but they have also supported educators like myself by creating a variety of scenarios for multi multiple disciplines. As you can see, Second Life promotes collaboration between learners, but it also facilitates working with different departments. For example, learners studying forensic science, public services and law can apply knowledge collaborating in a crime scene investigation. Second Life brings an element of novelty, wonderment and awe for learners. More importantly, as educators, we should be humble enough to learn alongside our learners. 
This adds value to their education and career prospects so they can thrive in the 21st century workforce. Gaio will show you now what is required to integrate pedagogy, tech, and consideration prior using the platform. Okay, let me just move on here. As I move on. Hi everyone, um, I plan design and build the CABC's bespoke virtual campus and resources. Um, I also train staff and learners to use Second Life so they can take full advantage of its educational features. Um, your lesson planning doesn't change at all using this platform. Teachers only teach, that is our motto. However, when planning your lesson, you will also work in collaboration with a virtual learning specialist from the TEL team of your institution. Josephine's lesson is a great example when pedagogy meets tech to enhance subject specific lesson uh, plans delivered on immersive activities in Second Life. We also ensure students are, um, um, are there as safe using virtual worlds. We've created our CABC Second Life registration portal, our own virtual reality code of conduct and implemented all necessary security systems. That means only our students and staff can access our virtual campus available 24 seven. We take care of everything. So staff and students are safe. Teachers need very minimum training, but those are crucial. There are two steps for, for you to use it. First, you sign up in Second Life. Second, you download a software called Firestorm Viewer and voila, you are ready for it. Um, both of these steps are free and you will um, have a better uh, performance accessing Second Life via a desktop or laptop. And now Itzel will tell you more about the benefits of using Second Life. Hi everyone. So Cardiff and Bell College is the first UK FE college to implement Second Life into the curriculum. Our Welsh themed virtual campus contains learning resources in both Welsh and English including multidisciplinary bespoke teaching tools and subject-specific simulation environments for education and training. The potential of this platform is limitless. Second Life does not require any expensive equipment. It's very cost-effective, accessible and highly sustainable. Teaching resources can also be shared and the educators don't need to worry about uh, adapting uh, anything for their subject because we have a tell team at hand to do it. Um, so virtual worlds like Second Life also allow learners to become creators. They can innovate and collaborate in student-led projects. This supports um, also inclusivity and diversity as the avatars can be customized according to gender, religion and ethnicity. Interacting through the use of an avatar gives learners a sense of presence so they can benefit from a globally diverse learning experience and even enjoy the social element of being in college. Second Life is a powerful teaching tool to engage students in fun, interactive 3D environments and is not a gaming platform. Teaching students to collaborate and function in virtual environments will provide them with skills that will be beneficial, if not crucial, for their success as they prepare to join the 21st century workforce. Education in Second Life nurtures learner creativity and innovation, which are core elements of this educational project, which underpins Cardiff and Bell College's values, inspirational, inclusive and influential, Thank you for listening. We're happy to take any of your questions. Just to let you know, I'm popping in the chat. Um, Gaio will be able to help you with anything technical. Josephine uh, will answer any teaching and learning experiences questions. And I can help you with examples of interdepartmental and international collaborations. Thank you very much. Dio. Wow. Wow. I I'm, I'm, I'm rarely speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Fairly speechless. I, I'm, I'm in awe of you as a college and your collaboration together, your professional practice to bring us something like this, but the possibilities are going to be endless. Yeah. So we're going to go for a 10 minute break. And I think in our reflections of learning later on, 
that we can come back to this because um, I'm sure there are going to be loads and loads of questions from so many people that want to ask you about potentially how they could adapt this and integrate it into their own subject areas and within their communities of learning. So it's a big, big thank you um, from all of us for that amazing presentation. Isn't it fantastic how, how wonderful how we're often so wowed by what digital technology can do and the whole aspect of inclusion and diversity and inspiration. So we're gonna go for a 10 minute break, which is gonna bring us, but well, it's gonna be five now. So you can have a little break off screen. So at 5.40, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be kicking off again. And I'm going to leave the recording running so that if any of you actually want to have some conversations going on in the background, that's absolutely fine. So five minutes is where we will be formally coming back and starting again at 5.40. So thank you very much to everybody who's presented so far.
Okay, everybody, I bet you're wondering, wow, where did that time fly? Where, where did it go to? Um, I think it's because um, we probably were all in awe and wonder of all the amazing presenters that we've had with us uh, this evening so far. And without further ado, because I like to be a stickler for time, uh, we are going to move on to the lovely Martin Thomas, who I just need to let you know is partial to a vanilla ice cream. OK, and uh, Martin is going to be sharing with us this evening um, about interacting with learners online. So, Martin, mm. it is over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Nia. Uh, right. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. I'm Martin Thomas, Teaching and Learning Coordinator at the College of Merthyr Tidville, where I also teach A-level physics and engineering. Lucy is going to be helping me with my, my slides tonight because of a little technical problem. So. Um, Lucy, uh, next slide, please. Yes, great, it works. When the college closed its doors for the first national lockdown, I, along with every other teacher and lecturer in the country, moved my lessons online for an, an unknown length of time. I'm sure that's a day that none of us will ever forget. But of course, the immediate problem that we all faced was how do we teach online? I was starting from scratch. And in the first week, I sent work by email. But I knew that this wasn't how I wanted to teach. I wanted to replicate the key aspects of a good lesson, but online. The following week, I recorded my lessons on video capture. The recorded sessions were more engaging than email and they gave me control over the quality of my output. But they were nothing like a real lesson because they lacked interaction with learners. So I needed to go back to basics. Next slide, please, Lucy. And the next one, please. The hardware that I had access to was a laptop, an iPad with Apple Pencil, and my mobile phone. I soon found myself teaching online using all three devices simultaneously. Now this might sound like two devices too many, but in fact, it's easier than constantly switching between screens. And it was this approach that interested Estin because I think they recognized that it allowed me to replicate the pace and interaction of a face-to-face -face lesson. All of the devices had access to Microsoft Teams, which is the online platform of the college. Sorry, Nina. <laughs> so how can we teach a high quality lesson online? Next slide, please. And the next one, people. I decided that I wanted to ace my lesson. So I concentrated on three things, assessment, challenge, and of course, engagement. For learners to be engaged online, they have to be actively involved every few minutes. Otherwise, they drift off mentally, perhaps even physically. Next slide, please. So here are my top tips for assessing challenging and engaging learners online. Number one, say hello. Say hello to every learner at the start of the session politely insist on a verbal response. If you know your learner, then you can tell a lot about their level of confidence or mood that day from the sound of their voice and their initial willingness to say hello. It also helps you to identify technical problems such as poor signal or dodgy sound. Number two, keep a tally chart. I write down every learner's name, and I tick it every time I ask a question. The tally chart, I'm oh, sorry, there's no need to go forward on the slides yet. You'll be back up there, Lucy. And again. And again. That's it, stay in that one. 
So the tally chart helps me keep track of the number of responses from each learner, and it makes sure that I'm not leaving anyone out. I try to pitch nominated questions to the ability and confidence of the learner, just like you would do in the classroom. Start each session with a number of quick fire questions. I use the chat function and the direct learners to give short written responses. Y for yes, N for no, T for true, F for false, a number or a keyword. The purpose is to immediately involve everyone. Read the learner responses out loud to acknowledge their input and give immediate praise when it's due. I actually read the responses on my mobile phone so that it doesn't interfere with my ability to share my computer screen. Cameras. I'm actually agnostic about cameras. I don't mind if they're on or off. But I know my colleagues have a number of innovative strategies for getting reluctant learners to use their cameras. How about bring an interesting object? Or wear your favourite hat? Or even fancy dress? <laughs> Next slide, please. Next is challenge. I found that an extended task is vital. Give learners 10 to 15 minutes to work out a challenging question. It gives them thinking time and an opportunity to deepen their understanding of the topic. The challenging task may be in the form of an examination question or even a breakout room discussion. Following the task, you could ask learners to share their learning so that others may benefit. Next slide, please. One of the problems with being online is the difficulty in viewing learners' work. The iPad and Apple Pencil combination is an excellent whiteboard tool. And when used in conjunction with Microsoft Class Notebook, I found that I was able to annotate uploaded work live in a way that provided learners with instant feedback. And this could then also act as exemplar work for the whole class. Next slide, please. Finally, then impact. I used Microsoft Forms to survey to find out which online teaching methods learners preferred and wanted more of. This enabled me to refine my approach over a period of time. Next slide, please. It was clear that learners preferred live lessons that followed their timetable, and uh, that was much sort of more preferential to recorded lessons or work sent by email. In addition, learners preferred the mixture of chat and verbal responses. The use of the iPad and pencil as a whiteboard and for annotating learners' work was universally popular. Next slide, please. Okay, overall impact. This is where the culture of sharing good practice that we have developed at Merthyr College really paid off. We had a large amount of training on how to teach online. Some of these sessions were led by external providers and they were excellent, Nina, but most contributions actually came from within the college. It's because of this, I believe, that I was able to interact successfully with learners online. Whilst there's no replacement for face-to-face -face teaching, I was able to maintain high levels of attendance, learner satisfaction, and in turn, this had a positive impact on learner well-being and ensured successful course outcomes. Okay, thank you. Wow, three digital devices at the same time, which is fantastic. And of course, we all know how amazing so many digital devices can be, um, especially if you've got a hand top, which is my new word for, you know, the iPhone. But has anybody got any questions for the lovely Martin now? Um, raise your hand, shout out, do a little giggle dance, anything at all. But I, I love the fact that you aced it there, Martin, and that you had a glamorous assistant in the background. Next slide, please. So if anybody's got any questions, you've got a minute before we move on to our next presenter. Raise your hand, shout out. The secret password tonight is vanilla. Anybody? No? Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you to Lucy. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to Lucy. Lucy is very quietly working in the background. And I have to say that Lucy has been spectacular. Uh, we've had chats, emails, sharing of this, sharing of that, checking of this, checking of that. Well, I think if ever I need somebody perfect to be helping me with anything, I'll be hashtag calling on Lucy. And talking about calling on at this point, um, thank you very much, Martin. Can I please welcome Sarah Davis, Chrysler Sarah from Progend College. And Hi, Sarah all. is going to be sharing with us what's the hook engagement from the off. So off you go. Not with our all. Great to be here tonight. I've really enjoyed all the presentations so far. Um, I've, my name is Sarah, as Mina um, said. I teach A-level law at Bridgen College. I'm also a um, PGC joint program leader and teach on the PGCE. And I'm also a teaching and learning coach. I approach this session tonight. I'm gonna make a bit of work, apologies. Um, I approach this session tonight from the point of view that we are all very overworked at the moment, we're under a lot of pressure, time, there's so much going on, particularly since COVID and we've come back in face-to-face -face teaching and just really taking things back to basics and looking at how important it is to get the start of the lesson right. Because usually if we get the start right and hook those learners from the start, then usually we've got them for the rest of the lesson. So this is not gonna be mind-blowing new massively creative inventive stuff but going back really to basics and are we engaging those learners as they're walking through the door so if you could for, to, for the next part this next sort of nine minutes could you just imagine that you are a level law learners hope that's okay with you all and you either walking into a class physically or you're actually going to be online these can be adapted for online I'm just gonna give you a sample of ones I use and how effective they are to engage learners. There are thousands of starters out there. I've really focused on ones that are quick wins for us as teachers that we can just pick up and literally will take us a couple of minutes to set up because we're all so, so very busy at the moment. So you walk in the class, guys. This picture is on the board. I don't even say to them what the topic is as they're walking in, before they, as they're putting their bags down, Look at this picture. Who is it? Write everything you know about this person. One minute with a partner, discuss it. And from there, we would then have a really good discussion around human rights, human rights in North Korea compared to here. But just by simply having an image on that board as they come in, or even on their desk, if you haven't got an interactive whiteboard or a TV in your room, just an image, something to grab their attention as they walk through that door because we know learners often find it really difficult to settle sometimes often because they're bored at the start so just something to get them thinking so why do we do them i think i probably already covered this but it's to ensure that learning can begin as soon as they enter the classroom that we can introduce a new um, idea or topic or recap or consolidate something from the previous session so again, like I just said, for this part, I want you to imagine now that you've walked into my lesson and it is the first topic on human rights, okay? So I'm gonna ask you some questions. So this is one thing I do a lot. And again, this is so simple to do. You can have this um, on flip chart paper, A3 paper. You could use the interactive whiteboard. You could use a Jamboard if you were doing this in, in Google online and the various other platforms. So as they're walking in the classroom, I'll have three pieces of paper placed around the walls with different statements on. This can be used for any level of learner. I also do this with my PGC learners and have very challenging statements that they really have to think about. So you can stretch and challenge learners here. So as they walk in, there'll be examples of statements. For example, now you're a level student, so a life sentence should mean life. The death penalty should be reinstated in the UK. Everyone should have the right to freedom of speech. As they're walking in, again, I say to them, write bags down. Okay, go and stand by the statement you most believe in. Walk around the room, have a look, stand there. Whoever joins you, have a chat with them for a few minutes. Why did you stand there? Then I will then question them as to why they stood there. 
And from there, we then have a really good detailed discussion about some of those things. And it leads me then into things that I obviously want to pick up with them. So I find that one works really well and it's such a simple and quick one to do. Another way I could do it, so you're walking into my lesson and on the board, I have a picture of a map. So I'd say, sit down guys, this is to do with human rights, no more clues. What do you think this picture is to do with? So I obviously, because of time guys, I'm not gonna ask you to put it in the chat, but maybe just have a little think about human rights, what you think that map might represent. The students usually say, oh, the red bits might be a bit dodgy. Is that where human rights are bad? And actually they're correct. And then I would say, okay, for digital literacy, use a Chromebook or your phone, research those, those countries. What are those countries? And again, we're sparking a really good discussion, which they can then discuss with a partner. So this is up as they're coming into the classroom. Or alternatively, I could show it in a picture. Again, like should prisoners have a right to vote, which again, often sparks a very detailed discussion. To also embed um, numeracy, I could show it as a statistic as they're walking in. Again, that could be on the table or it could be on the screen if they join the Google Meet online. We use Google at the college or a Google college or Teams or whatever platform you use. Or again, it could be on the interactive whiteboard. As they walk in, I say, right, guys, human rights today, have a wild guess, no wrong answer. What do you think those stats are to do with? And that usually really gets them thinking. I will give you the answer. Um, there's three countries that account for 80% of executions in the world, and 60% of people um, live in countries where they have the death penalty. And I don't care if they don't guess those right, because they'll guess something to do with human rights, which again could spark a discussion that goes off in another, in another way that I wasn't thinking of, and it's just to get the learners thinking and engaged in the session from the off. So here's some other examples I use as well. Um, matching and sequencing, I find really good. This takes a little bit longer to prepare. So again, if I'm um, going back to a level law, I'll have a set of cards that I've prepared, which may have a case name on or a picture, and it'll have the facts of the case. And as they're coming in, I say, open the envelope, sit down, match up the case with the name. It's really simple, but it's so effective. Just a minute, I use a lot. So again, as they're coming in, I'll say, right, last week's lesson, guys, I want you to summarize that into three sentences or three bullet points, then three words. And now I want you to tell the partner all about it in one minute. I'm going to time you with a timer on your table using no notes. Brilliant for recap. I love this one, be creative. I've actually, I think a lot of areas can use this. I've given some examples on there of sport and maybe fashion. I've used it in law to ask students to create a whole new um, scheme around legal aid, but you could use it for create a new sport and explain how to play it. You've got 10 minutes. 54321 is another one, again, which is so simple to use. So again, as they're walking in, I'll have on the board or on the table in front of them or on the screen as they join online. 54321, so for example, five types of crime, four types of punishment, three people in the courtroom, two recent cases from your country, one famous case, and I put a timer on, an interactive timer, you've got two minutes, off you go. And that really then makes them think and again grabs their attention as they come in. Finally, um, thanks I use quite a lot as well, philosophical questions where there is no right or wrong answer. So again, as they're coming in, there's something there to grab them, which doesn't take us a lot of time to pre um, prepare. But is it ever right to break the law? Um, I put this one up the other day, actually, for my level class, and they were saying, well, yeah, of course it is if somebody's attacking you. I said, ah, but is that breaking the law? That's a defence, self-defence. So then they go, oh, right, OK. And then they talk about all different moral issues. So again, and this is just when they're unpacking their bags. That's what's so brilliant. It's just really getting them thinking and engaged. And music. I use music quite a lot as well, just to sort of set the scene. Another thing I do totally unrelated to my subject is I often spend a minute at the start saying, I don't do this all the time, otherwise it would be repetitive. Give me a positive, guys, a positive thing that happened to you last week. And I often have some learners say, well, nothing nice happened to me last week. Um, but I usually get something out of them. And then it took a minute or two, but it sets them up into a really positive frame of mind for them for learning. So to summarize, guys, um, when we're looking at the features of a really good starter, and I know there's thousands of them, and I've just picked some really quick wins that we can take away and use. Um, they should be short, probably no more than 10 minutes, have lots of pace, 
getting them talking and being interactive. They should be inclusive. So designed to get everyone involved. And I think this is the key for me. They should be motivational. I love the success you see with the starter, that the learner's confidence. Oh, we thought of that, we got it right. That's brilliant. So they've got that early success at the start of the lesson, which really then inspires them to do well and be engaged for the rest of the lesson. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and Vara, and any questions I'm happy to take. Diolch, Sara, session gwych, gwych. Um, I think my boss, Ian Gilbert, who is the creator of Thanks, would be very interested in that. There's the little book of thanks. There's more thanks. There's thank for thinking. And I always think about this one, which is absolutely brilliant. It's a broken down car park. And if you had my heart and I had yours, would you be me or would I be you? I mean, that's enough at six o'clock at the night, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? I have got a slideshow with about 100 thanks on for all different areas. Happy to share that with anybody. Brilliant. Um, and I've also got a slide sh uh, show with about 100 starters on as well. Happy to share that with anybody too. Wow. What a fantastic evening of collaboration, communication, creativity and care for each other. Sarah, that's absolutely fantastic. Did you know there is a thanks.co.uk site where your students can add things as well? And I have just sent a picture to Ian Gilbert on at Independent Thinking, at ITL Worldwide, to say that you've been talking about that tonight, which oh, is absolutely brilliant. brilliant. See you, He'll be absolutely chuffed to bits. And talking about chuffed to bits, um, I gotta get my geography right here now, okay? So Karen, when I said to you earlier, I can't believe that you live in so-and-so and you drive all the way to so-and-so, only then to be reminded that Karen Phillips is with us next, is from St. David's, Col uh, St. David's Catholic Sixth Form College, which is in Cardiff. It's not down there in Haverford West. So I don't know. I don't know what happened there, but we are just past six o'clock and we've got the lovely Karen who's going to be sharing with us the use of modelling in law to enhance learner understanding of assessment outcomes. So Karen from Cardiff, Cowbridge, wherever you're from. I do know where you're from, but I don't want to tell people where you're actually living. Um, welcome. And we're really excited to be seeing this session. Thank you very much. Um, you got more law from me, actually, following on from, from Sarah. Um, let me just put the, uh, the screen up there. So, um, yeah, so what I'm going to be looking at is uh, strategies used to develop teaching and learning in A-level law, focusing on modelling and the colour coding of assessment objectives and how we've moved that on from, from there. Um, so we think that modelling for students what a good answer looks like uh, in law is a critical part of the success of the course. Uh, and law for most learners is new and they're going to be faced with new assessment objectives requiring them to answer examination questions in a particular way. Um, with law they face new skills of application of the law uh, and evaluation along with the, the usual knowledge and understanding um, and that needs to be intertwined then with the explanation of the law. Um, they need to integrate legal authority to support the points they make uh, and showing them how to do this early on is important so they can then model their own uh, and produce a good law answer. Um, so they need to understand really what a good law answer looks like from the outset. And, and to do this, we use WAGLs, which stands for what a good one looks like, uh, containing annotation. And you can see some examples there on the, on the slide um, explaining really what makes it a good response. Uh, but we also use wabbles, which is what a bad one looks like. Um, and the, the wabbles then can be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, for example, they can mark the wabble, <laughs> uh, correct it uh, as part of a dirt activity at the end, and thereby learn what was wrong with it and how then to produce one of their own, which is of better quality. Um, then on the right of that example, you can see in the bottom of the slide, uh, that there's usually an examiner summary detailing the mark achieved and the band then within which the mark would fall. Um, and this helps really familiarise learners with assessment objective banding, the criteria used by the exam board, uh, and, and just to gain an understanding of how scripts are marked. Um, it also usually provides examples of how scripts then could be improved, how the work could be improved. 
So to develop the use of, of models, um, we have started in, in some of our, our models to colour code assessment objectives at both AS and A2 law. Uh, and then we construct model answers using this code. Um, so, for example, on, on, on the screen, you can see the explanation of the law for A01, assessment objective one is in orange, and the application then of the law uh, for assessment objective two is in green. Um, and this reflects that application of the law to a particular scenario for unit three of the A2 exam, for example, is required for 30 of the 50 marks available. Um, so this AO then is coloured green to emphasise to students the importance of applying the law and the fact that they won't get those marks if they don't have that in addition to their explanation of the law. Students then, interestingly, often produce work for us in different colours, which is a benefit to them, but it also assists the teacher with marking. Um, and the most sophisticated responses then successfully marry the two assessment objectives together. So what we have here then is just a further example of the use of colour coding to identify the different elements of the answer. Um, AO1 uh, and AO2 skills, but we've also got here uh, an example of a standard introduction that they could use and, and you know, the, the importance then of, of developing those literacy skills, how to construct a good answer, um, how to link from one paragraph to the next can be done with, as you can see here, the purple parts, which are connectors, introductions, conclusions, uh, and this helps develop skills of literacy and how to construct a good answer uh, when they have to write at length for two hours for, for our exam, for example. It also helps them to layer their writing uh, and to assist them with the flow of their response. Uh, and the skills developed, we think, for these longer responses are transferable to their other curriculum subjects, so thereby enhancing their wider skills development. So an additional strategy then, which removes the model and hands over some greater independence to the learner then is the use of a writing frame. Uh, writing frames we think help to build confidence uh, and structure their answer using, in this example, a PDE approach, which is point, develop, evaluate, um, in relation to a given past paper question. Sentence starters are given, prompts are included uh, so that students can include certain key points and legal authority, things we know will get them the credit uh, in the exam. Uh, but it also helps to guide them with their essay structure, with introductions, paragraph, main body uh, that links to the question uh, and the conclusion at the end. Um, and consolidating. Uh, an additional strategy, sorry, the, the consolidation all the aforementioned strategies is, is really the, the frequency with which learners are assessed. Um, all of their assessments are past paper questions and mostly take place in class under timed conditions. Uh, and we often walk through the first uh, few big assessments um, with a, a, you know, a walking, talking, mock uh, style assessment to build their confidence and then we, we try to remove um, the, the assistance as the year progresses to build their confidence. They're also guided as to how to unpick the questions, identifying legal issues by using the structures below. Um, and this is particularly important when dealing with a long scenario at A2 level where they have to write at length on one question for 50 minutes to an hour, depending on the paper. Uh, the table on the right hand side here allows their students to deconstruct the answer uh, and con sorry, deconstruct the question and construct their response uh, in a way which then replicates the previously seen models. So it's another example of a writing frame effectively, but contains less information than the previous example. Um, and as the year progresses, we give students greater independence, removing the models as their confidence grows. Um, and we think the removal of these training wheels almost after confidence has been built will help prepare them for the nature of the exam. Um, and of course, this year, that's going to be ever more important uh, because they're lacking that exam skill preparation as they haven't sat GCSEs necessarily or proper AS levels, um, but they may very well face actual A2 exams. So then following on from the models and assessment, uh, they're provided with feedback, which relates to exam criteria and bandings. Uh, the language that we used in this feedback replicates that used in the exam, uh, but is rephrased often in a way that is understandable and meaningful to the learner. Uh, learners then gain confidence 
for using these bandings. And as the year progresses, they can engage effectively in self and peer marking tasks. And then to conclude and draw it all together, uh, we've got DIRT activities, uh, so dedicated improvement and reflection time uh, embedded into delivery where learners are given time to respond to feedback on their written work and improve their answers in full or in part. Uh, and that takes us really from the circle of providing that full model answer through to them correcting their own work, understanding what a good law answer looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Wow, a wealth of strategies there for us to think about that you're using um, as exemplars in, in law. And thank you for your succinct presentation. So many different examples there. Um, it really is absolutely brilliant. And we've had a question in um, from a D. Dooley. OK, what tips would you give other teachers to make their modelling effective and where can subjects obtain modelled answer from to use with their students? So basically your expertise to have impact on other, other subjects. Yeah, I think as long as teachers understand their assessment objectives, it, this can be replicated across any any subject. Um, it depends on whether you have one or two assessment objectives feature within a particular question, uh, or even as we've done, if, if students are answering a whole past paper question, they may very well then construct their answer using different colours. If, for example, question one and two are AO1, question three then is AO1 plus AO3, um, it gets them to understand the importance of the different skills needed to answer a particular style of question. So those command words explain or evaluate or apply the law. Um, you know, are incredibly important for us. And that can be replicated across any subject, I think, uh, that uses AOs. Um, for the second question there, where can, where can they obtain models from? Uh, we often use our own students' work. Um, so, you know, if the student produces a really cracking piece of work, then we're not going to create work for ourselves, making a, an even better version when it's, it's great to begin with. Um, in addition to that, you've got the OERs on the WJC exam website. Um, you've got current and former student work. Um, you've got lots of examples that the WJC have provided uh, that can be used. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And what I really, really like at this at this point, if we check the chat, the fact that you're all sort of supporting and agreeing and suggesting together, this is where, you know, at the beginning of the session today, we talked about collaboration and, com and communication. And a big thank you to Louisa, Sarah and Catherine for coming in on that and saying that particularly right now, that so many of these approaches are really crucial um, for our students because we've had that sort of lull of lack of face-to-face -face and being prepared for exams and sort of getting that whole mindset mindset right really for what are the expectations when they're in that scenario again of meeting the needs of specific exam criteria, answering questions, modelling, assessment, outcomes, feedback and so forth. Which brings me on to um, the last bit of our session this evening where we're going to be looking at um, taking some time to reflect and this is where it's time for us now. I'm going to add a little why on to something that Karen was just talking about. And instead of dirt time, let's have it being a little bit of dirty time. Because when I speak with students and say, oh, do you know what? You need to go home and have a little bit of dirty time, which is directed improvement reflection time based on learning and progress. And we all have a bit of a giggle on it, particularly when some of our students go home and they say to their parents, uh, I can't be speaking with you now, but ending, I need to go upstairs. I need to have some dirty time. And the, and the amount of time I've had parents ringing me saying, excuse me, why, why are my children coming home saying that they're going upstairs to have some dirty time? Well, I said it's all related to learning and progress and reflection. And, and then we all have a laugh and a giggle about it because, you know, there's nothing like a, a little bit of dirty time is there to reflect and to think. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, we're going to have some collaboration together at this point. OK, so I've just popped in the chat for you um, something that I want you to uh, have a look at. Uh, we're going to go into a Mentimeter, OK, and with a Mentimeter, this is totally, totally anonymous. 
Um, I've had the option there to share this link with you in the chat. If I was in a classroom right now, possibly I could be potentially downloading a QR code, or you could be right now taking your hand tops and placing that on the screen so that you can get onto that QR code, which is going to take you very nicely to this um, presentation um, of which you are going to be anonymously sharing what are your key takeaways from today's session. And already we can see that so many people are talking about engagement, active learning, thanks, innovation, digital innovation, if you didn't manage to get that link in the chat, you can go to menti.com and pop in the code 24, that's my age, 95, that's how I feel in the morning, 61, that could potentially be the number of flavours of ice creams that I like, and two, which is the age I'd like to be again. So already we can see we've got 16 people in our interactive room to be able to see straight away what we're reflecting on, what we're gonna be the key takeaways today. So we've got dirt and dirty, oh yeah, some great lesson starters, and um, passion for teaching and learning, definitively and definitely. And I think actually what I've really learned myself from this evening is about, the fact that so many of you as really passionate pedagogical practitioners have been so willing to model, number one, what you're doing in your own learning environment, your own teaching and learning environment, being prepared to actually say something, let's strip it right back. Not that we're going on to any sort of naked teaching tonight, but stripping it back and going back to sometimes what are the real basics for hooking in our learners, really finding out what's really important about what their needs really are? Um, there's nothing better than some scaffolding sometimes and that bravery of taking risks of, as I said to you, either trying something new or taking something that you felt very comfortable with for a very long time and accessorizing it or you know developing it into something new what i like to like to think about is is some sort of like um spiral now i'm sure all of you know that i'm quite partial to a slinky and i like to think about it as being slinky learning so that we're often moving in between what we feel is do you know i'm really strong and powerful as I am with so many of these skills and strategies that I learned, but also having that ability to move in and out of feeling and being uncomfortable when we're challenging ourselves, because that's what we're asking our learners to do, most definitely, is sometimes to come out of their comfort zone. Now, I absolutely love the fact that we've been looking at so many different things to do with pedagogy and practice this evening. A celebration of learning, of education in action. And if we were to move on to really think about summarizing um, what it is that potentially you could be taking away with you tonight, um, what I'd like to do at this point is let me just come out of this screen and we're going to go into the next screen of uh, the Mentimeter which is to ask you to consider this okay how will you now move forward and develop your pedagogy based on the sessions that we've had tonight okay so what will you think about? What will you be brave about? What will you take away, but actually adapt it for your own specific learning environment and the students that you are actually working with? So this is your chance. You use the same 
a code, the same link, and this is like a second slide. But this is a chance now for you to write in text about what will you, you will do. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think there, somebody referring to trying out podcasts. And the podcasts session, which we had earlier from Paul, definitely stretch and challenge, not just students, but yourself. Thank you very much. And you see, the great thing about this is, I don't know, and neither do you, who it is that's responding anonymously. So you may already be using a tool like Mentimeter for your students, particularly when Martin spoke about, you know, hooking and integrating learners from the very, very beginning. Yes, now I think we're going to come back to in just a second, uh, talking a little bit more about Second Life, because when people say, you know, this is free, you can access this, you can do this a bit, a bit, a bit this way for this subject, this is how we're doing it in sort of crime prevention. I, I'm keen to explore and find out really how quickly this can be adapted because we're living in a changing world. And imagine if some of your students literally can become these avatars almost the very next day that you've actually downloaded this. Somebody there saying, yes, they're going to use the 54321 tomorrow. And always remember the individual, not the group. Yes. So we can be great in having group discussion, group work, connected thinking, but always coming back to thinking about that individual person that's in our class and what their learning and living differences could potentially be. I love the fact, I mean, I, I, you know, being somebody who is um, uh, passionate about additional learning needs, I love the way that um, it's been posted there about using podcasts for additional learners as an alternative way to learning or a different or a connected way. Um, yes, having sessions that are still skill focused. Um, somebody says they want to use the waggles and the wabbles. And as you can see here, as we're going down, the CSI stuff was fab. And I'm definitely going to be looking into this. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I potentially like down last night. I was I was watching something about, you know, I am a murderer, not me particularly, but it was a documentary and, you know, the making of a murderer. So many things that we're fascinated about, particularly about real life scenarios and situations. I mean, there's nothing like about um, 999, what's your emergency, being inside the ambulance. It just makes it real and bringing it back to, you know, what... Um, one of our presenters was saying earlier about bringing real life people in their uniform, in their jobs, into that learning environment. And um, yeah, vodcasting as well, which is fantastic. I mean, none of us, I, I don't think, really like the sound of our own voices, do we? And it's okay when we're in this virtual uh, situation right now where we can see each other, but it's when we look at that recording and we hear our voices, sometimes we potentially think, wow, do I really sound like that? No, I can't honestly be looking like that. And actually getting over that barrier or hurdle with our students can be really, really challenging sometimes. So can I, at this point now, ask to bring in the fabulous people from, well, everybody's fabulous, right? Okay, this being here this evening. But can I ask to bring back in uh, the CAVC group um, of uh, wonderful individuals, Gaia and Josephine and Itzel. Now then, would you mind at this stage, because I think we're all still just that little bit curious of, can you strip it back and simplify it for us? If we want to use Second Life tomorrow or think about exploring it, what do we need to do step by step? Sure thing. Um, basically, it's three steps. You just sign up in Second Life. You go there and create your account. To okay. You just download Firestorm, which is a free software as well. Okay, and hold that hold that there, there for a stop now. <laughs> Number one, we're all gonna go across to Second Life. Yeah, 
Uh, I will actually share with you uh, a link with some Q and A with like of the uh, that we did also for the, in a different events that I can just share here and you can follow. Brilliant. Um, I just, I'm gonna type it here in the chat now, and you can Excellent. just have a look in this Q and A, which can be useful. But that's it. You 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 access it. You just type it on Google Second Life, and then you, you see the website where you can pretty much create your account. That's number one. Number two. You type Firestorm Viewer on Google as well, and then you can just download the, the newest Firestorm Viewer, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, and then you just create your you just put your your details there, and then you are in with in Second Life. Um, I, I would recommend you have a look in this link that I sent, which there's some um, important like a Q and A uh, questions from the event that we did together as well at JISC. Um, and then it can kind of uh, help um, some students and also teachers to find out how to integrate that in their teaching and so on. Fantastic. It's very simple. Oh, brilliant. So if I had a photograph of myself now, full body, okay, um, <laughs> then I would be able to avatar myself into Second Life immediately. Yes. You, you, you would have to you, you would have to you uh, once you are there you are able to learn how to change your um, your shape how to change your hair how to change your, your skin so it's very very it's great like it, it's, it's very useful um, Whoa. yeah are you for real? <laughs> you do, so you I could become I could become like Lara Croft from Tomb Raider oh yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> I am on it like a rash this evening. <laughs> I really, really am. This is brilliant. And then you can just create these virtual environments in any scenario, you know, to do with any type of learning. And are there built-in backgrounds or, you know, or do we just have to go away and, and play and practice? Well, let me tell you something, Nina. Uh, we used it with our travel and tourism students as well. And Second Life has real life uh, replicas of destinations mm -hmm. so there are many subjects that you know you already have the content there it doesn't all have to be bespoke but obviously it's great to have somebody like Gaio that customizes our uh, learning environments like he did for Josephine but our students used it for project-based learning and they collaborated with uh, Chinese students in Shanghai over you know COVID-19 at the beginning and it was just great because they had a globally diverse learning experience. And they also had, obviously, the Chinese students practice their English. And our uh, travel and tourism students gained relevant uh, vocational experience in travel and tourism. So it's, it's fantastic. You should definitely come in and you can be anything you want. Lara Croft, anyone. <laughs> fantastic. That is brilliant. And the thing is, I'm just thinking now, I've had some amazing holidays previously with some very dear friends um, in a very special holiday destination in Gran Canaria. So literally, we could be recreating all of that. And I shall say no more at that point. But mm -hmm. to really to round up this evening on our reflections and on our learnings. And I've got to tell you, my notebook is just like, I mean, look at it. It's just, it's full to the top okay and if we go back to Paul um Paul thank you very much for all of your work on podcasting and I love the fact that you talk I I mean I need to be careful what I say here about listicles okay not popsicles and things like that but listicles podcasts that are really short to the point that keep us actively learning and those short conversations I adore that. I also do know as well, because I'm, I'm very interested in the application and the use of digital technology, that we can use those voice changes, just saying, okay, which is absolutely brilliant. But yeah, that, that all the data that you provided with us as well about the most people spending like 44 minutes per day and then on to Jane with invisible uh, learners and the model in the skills bringing in the external practitioners making assessment choices with the skimming and the scanning and talking about gamification you know that whole thing about getting them to think about quizzes and chats and everything making it creative 
And I love what you said there, which was like sneaking it in, okay? Sneaking in some of the really difficult, challenging things. And let's not make it like a classroom straight jacket, but it is a multi-skilled experience. Um, and before I go on, can I say a really big thank you to Glyn Rogers, who's been on it like a rash tonight on social media. So Glenn, thank you very much for that. And then to Gaia and Josephine and Itzel and, and all of the second life that you've brought together. I'm now curious to share this with my partner about making a virtual reality world of real life jazz musicians, you know, with photographs of themselves where they can move and interact. I think we're gonna have hours of fun i'm going to pocket this passion and thank you for sharing that with us to martin about interacting with your learners and all your digital tools but also hooking in your learners really straight away and giving them annotated feedback um, everybody loves somebody's handwriting, don't they? Which is fantastic. And only to know that now with an iPad, that if somebody has got um, some dysgraphia problems, that they can use Scribbler so that when they're actually writing, if we can't understand their writing, but it turns it into text. And definitely you are acing your lessons and the fact that we're going to be doing that with assessment, challenge and engagement. And I love the fact when you said about those really short, quick responses, Y for yes, N for no, true, false, TF, a number or a keyword, or even possibly an emoji. So lots of collaboration, communication, and creativity really coming through tonight with the care as well. And Sarah, going back to, I love what you said about going back to basics and stripping it back, starting with those hooks, getting those starters right you know once we're hooked in right at the very beginning it's like when you're at a buffet isn't it and maybe you've just you know eaten something that is just so gorgeous that you keep going back for more I don't know why the theme is always around food but anyway and then the pictures on the board and research blended learning matching sequencing thanks and music positive frameworks Karen with your modeling of amazing assessment and outcomes color coded systems Ooh, we all like a bit of color coding don't we and that consolidation of learning but more importantly um you talked about feedback and what i'd like to do tonight first of all is to give everybody that's been part of um colleges wales all colleges tonight a bit of feedback to say what an amazing event that you've put on thank you to everybody behind the scenes on the scenes and in the scenes to our presenters and basically to wish you all successful pedagogical journeys ahead and a massive thank you for inviting me it's always a privilege and a pleasure and now that i'm back on the road i think i need to be buying a lot more wagon wheels to come and visit you all to have a cup of coffee cup of tea and share them out where maybe we can have some further um, discussions as well so at this point right now it's back over to you kelly and thank you very much well, what can I say? Thank you so much, Nina. Uh, just, to, just for me to say thanks to everyone for attending. I'm sure you'd all agree it was a really informative, really, really useful session. Thank you all. Thanks to our colleges for sharing their, their tips and, and practices. I think um, you'll all agree there's been so many things, so, so many sort of takeaway tips, um, for, you know, so many sort of interesting and inspirational talks this evening. So thank you. Thanks to Welsh Government who uh, funded our Teach Meets and uh, Teaching and Learning network thanks to nina for your inspiring passionate um input tonight and for managing this event so efficiently thank you very much um thanks to our southeast network of colleges for bringing real insight and sharing their, their practice this evening i've just got a couple of announcements we've got two further teach meets events one in december and one in february so uh keep we'll keep you posted on the dates for those. If you have any further questions, please get in touch with our communications manager, Lucy Hopkins, who has been fantastic behind the scenes this evening and organizing our event. So thanks to Lucy. Lucy's uh, contact details can be found on our website and uh, on Clegg and Cymru website. So thanks to everybody and have a, have a really good evening. Diolch. Thank you, everybody.